Hello everyone, in this video we'll talk about a captive portal. If you've ever connected to an open or guest network, which doesn't require a password, however, when you try to browse the internet, you realize that you are redirected to a web page where you have to either enter an access code or enter your name and email, you most likely may have interacted with a captive portal. This is very common with open and free Wi-Fi networks, and this helps network owners to enforce security and isolate the guest and open network from their internal network. And this configuration is mostly done on the firewall or router. So in this video, we'll quickly look at what a captive portal is and how it is configured at the back end. So let's get started by trying to understand what a captive portal is. So a captive portal is an access control measure which intercepts HTTP or HTTPS traffic and redirects users to a login page before granting them internet access. So normally, if a captive portal has been configured, when you try browsing the internet or using any application, you most likely be redirected to a login page where you might have to accept acceptable use policies, enter an access code, a one-time password. And users are typically redirected to a landing page where they must log in, accept terms, or enter voucher codes before proceeding. Furthermore, captive portals are commonly configured in corporate guest networks, public Wi-Fi hotspots, and the hospitality industry, particularly in hotels where you may attend conferences or even when you want to use the internet in your room. So one of the major reasons a captive portal may be configured is for network access control to ensure that only authorized users and compliant devices can connect to the network. So when you configure a captive portal, you can set rules to ensure that only up-to-date devices can connect to the network. Furthermore, a captive portal may be configured to restrict bandwidth usage per user or group to prevent network congestion. So in this case, a network owner may decide to restrict the speed and volume of network traffic a user or group of users may be entitled to. Another reason a captive portal may be configured is to enforce acceptable use policy to ensure that users agree and accept terms and conditions before accessing the network. Another reason for configuring a captive portal may be to enforce authentication for guest users. So because guest users' credentials may not be sitting on your authentication server, you may decide to configure a captive portal where guest users may require one-time passwords or a code to authenticate to the network. So a captive portal may be configured in several ways. This is an example of how a captive portal may look. This is a Starbucks free Wi-Fi where all you have to do is click connect. There may also be another instance where you might have to enter an access code and tick a button to agree to terms and conditions before you can proceed to use the internet. There may also be cases where you might have to enter a username or password that you have been given by the network owner. So depending on the type of network device you may be using, you can configure your captive portal in several ways. And if you're looking to set up a virtual home lab just to understand how a captive portal works, you can do that using the PFSense router and firewall, which is an open source software you can download and install as a virtual machine. And in a subsequent video, I'll show you how to set up PFSense as a router and firewall and configure a captive portal. So let's briefly look at how a captive portal works. It starts with a user initiating a connection to a router or an open network. And once you connect to that open network and try to access the internet, you're likely to be presented with a pop-up where you might have to enter an access code or tick a button to accept terms and conditions before finally you can access the internet. So let's take a look at how a captive portal configuration page looks like on a PFSense firewall. So we are currently in my PFSense dashboard and to access the captive portal configuration page, you go to services and then you go to captive portal. I've already configured a captive portal zone. So to edit it, you go to actions, you click edit, and these are the configurations you can change. So you can set a captive portal for the LAN or the WAN network. You can set maximum concurrent connections. 
you can limit the number of people that can log in to the network at the same time. You can set an idle timeout where users are disconnected when there's no activity on the network. You can set hard timeout where after an amount of time has elapsed, a user is disconnected from the network. You can also set traffic quota in megabytes. You can set um, pass-through credits per MAC address. There are so many things you can set and um, you can set a number of concurrent user logins. If a user can log in from multiple devices using the same username or access code. And you can even decide to set a custom captive portal in PFSense. So you may decide to upload an HTML file to suit how your captive portal should look. And further below, you can decide to enable HTTPS logging to make it more secure. And when you go to the other tabs, you can decide to allow um, specific MAC addresses, white lists. And another thing, maybe you may decide to configure vouchers such that um, vouchers generated are the only way that users can access the internet. So you may decide to generate voucher codes and distribute to every user so that their usage on the internet can be monitored. And if you want to monitor usage of your guest network, you can go to status, go to captive portal, and you'd see all the devices that have logged into your network. And in this case, just one device has logged in. So in a subsequent video, we'll look at how to configure a captive portal specifically in PSNs and in a virtual environment. So thank you for watching.